to present this. This might be weird to present, but we'll give it a try. Um, Okay. So, all right, there we go. So talking about the actual standards, goal one is using the target language. So we can do that to do goal two, three, and four. So connecting with the other disciplines, obviously that's goal three and that's with the history. So it, people in high school, it's like, oh, we're learning history as well. We learned that in history, cool. We're, so it interacts. Um, cultural competence, I'm talking a lot about German history, some of the culture that goes along with it, and then comparing sometimes our own culture with the German culture. So what kind of artifacts can we use to teach history? So I think I hit on all of these throughout the presentation. So historical readings and documents first, literature, including children's literature, poetry, photos, drawings, music, and even art. When I first started teaching like 800 years ago, um, anytime that I wanted to teach something on history, I was like, I would do it in English. And now we have to rethink how are we going to do that in the foreign language to make it accessible to students? How can I get the point across using the German and have it comprehensible to the students? So that's kind of a switch from 40 years ago when I started. So I'm starting at level one. So what can we do at level one? One of the first things that they learn are numbers, dates. So here is a partner activity. So you're going to say, hmm, when was something discovered? And your partner, has, so you have part A, partner, so Kelly would have partner A and Olaf would have partner B. So you have different information there. So Kelly would say, hmm, wann wurde, no, she would have to go down here, wann wurde Kindergarten erfunden? And Olaf could say, ah, 1830, he can add, by frugal or not, however easy you want to make it. So just practicing the dates to get them to do the numbers correctly. Another thing would be if you're talking World War II numbers, how many people died in World War II? Um, if I were doing this, I would also say, hmm, here is dying cost. So here's, uh, do you, Crystal, you want me to keep it in English so that um, people, can look in and understand it. Is that best? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I, so I want to keep yeah. flipping. And there's one more new uh, audience member. Okay. Not, not German yeah. problem. I can't see anybody. So all I see is my screen. So I would talk about what. So why is that a comma there? Oh, the Germans use commas instead of. Um, a period. So five, we would say 5.8 million, but gee, the Germans say five with a comma eight um, and then a space there. So a little bit of culture. They also get some nationalities here as they go along. So that could be done very easily in a level one or early on in a semester. An easy poem um, that could be very, very beginning level. Um, Pre-teach your vocabulary with pictures. So you could have a picture of a train and you could have a picture of a doll and a ball and a little kitty. And so you could pre-teach that and they do spiele, so play and games and um, what do you do in your free time very easily. So this is a poem talking about, for those that don't speak German, ah, with the train, we go to grandma's, that's fun. So everything's fun. And then you get down to, the panzer, the tank. And what do you do with the tank? Oh, you break everything else, you ruin it. Um, so an easy poem, but with a different meaning, definitely a different meaning. Wolf Biermann, um, I'll talk about later too, was from East German, dissident, etc. Another beginning level um, thing, during depression or after World War I, um, inflation was rampant 
and the cost of even bread kept going up. So from 1919, it was 80 cents and 1923, I don't even know what that number is. <laughs> Looking how much money they had to spend to get a loaf of bread. So you could say, so when, why was that? Why did that happen? How could you pay that much money for bread? When did World War I end? What happened after World War I? Why did bread cost that much? And then all of a sudden it's 30 cents. So what happened in 1924 to make that happen? So those non-German people, yeah, they had a new currency come in and that made your hyperinflation also end. So you could talk about, so what's this? Oh, 50,000 marks. Can you buy, can you even get a 50,000 um, bill these days? No. What's the highest bill that you can get in English and American money? Can you even get a $500 um, bill anymore? I don't even know. I don't think you can get a thousand anymore. And this is 50,000. Holy cow. Um, and then what do you think this picture shows for those non-German speakers? Yeah, that's money. So that they would take wheelbarrows full of money to go buy bread. So these are laundry baskets full of money. Okay, so, so those were very beginning things that I think you could do. Um, then turning to literature. So um, what picture do you get in your head? Allie, Allie Moeller uh, has done something similar to this before. So what do you think of with, with coffee, I think? What do you think of when you hear the word bread? What picture comes to your mind? Crystal, what comes to mind since you're a non-German person? Um, when we talk about bread, what I think of it, like tiny buns with, you know, uh reasons on it sometimes some cream on it that's uh you know very popular in china and also some like uh tiny meat bits <laughs> that's chinese bread i know for sure what would our students say what what picture would come to their mind if we say bread i think it's sandwich bread like wonder bread or a loaf of bread exactly yeah yeah it comes in a package yeah. And what would we think of if we were German? Mm, a big crusty loaf or a brotchen, something that you have to cut yourself. Yeah. Exactly. And for breakfast, I would say, ah, that's my favorite meal time because I can have all of this bread. How about this picture? It looks like somebody that doesn't have enough money and it's old crusty bread. Mm. Like it's just been left around and there's crumbs. Oh, like, why would somebody leave crumbs out? They had to run away. Oh, maybe. So Wolfgang Borchert wrote Das Brot, the bread, and it's a really short story. It could probably do be done at a level three level, probably. Um, the story comes from 1946, so historical context, what happened, when did World War II end, what was life like after the war. Um, the good thing about Wolfgang Borchardt is he writes very simple sentences. There's a lot of repetition in, his, in the stories. He uses the same words frequently, um, so the students could read that, read the story, and there's the link to it. Um, you could talk about, so what's the setting, what's the time, what's the problem? Um, so relationship between a man and a wife, what do we know about them? How old are they? What do you think they look like? Um, symbols in the story, the bread crumbs, cold comes up several times, light comes up several times, and then the couple is lying to each other, they're lying to each other. So are there good lies and bad lies or are all, ba all lies bad? Um, and then the story ends with the lady giving the husband her 
extra slice of bread the next night at supper time. And why does why does she do that? Isn't she hungry? And so it's a really neat, neat story. And that could lead into discussing um, the zero hour, which was the end of World War II, Trümmer Literatur, which is a category um, made by um, Bull. You could talk about the Hunger Winter. What would that be? That's a cognate, pretty much. What would that be? Trümmer Frauen. Oh, I see Trümmer again. Rationing. Um, and these were just some stats that I pulled out that I share with my German literature class. So the agriculture, what 80% of the food was needed before was able to be pro provided by Germany. And after the war, only 35% was able to be provided. So you can see why they would be hungry. Um, another story then, literature-wise, is um, Bo's anecdote for the lowering of um, the work morale. It was written in 1960. So you have to think about, okay, what's happening in 1906 or 1963, sorry, what was happening in 1963. Um, and I would probably start with, what do you see in this picture? Um, who are the two people? What's happening? And then if I can I think I have this already shared. Um, new share, let's go. Um, let's do it this way. Um, so which one is it? Is it that one? I hate sharing. That's not it. And that's not going to do it either. All right. Sorry. My technology is not friendly. All right. All right. Well, why don't I see it? Maybe I won't share it with you. <laughs> there it is, all right. Was happening there. Are y'all still there and can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> yes. It's like uh, yeah. two different ideologies on what they wanted from life or what they thought their goal in life should be is what it looked like. One of them said, you need to do this and work harder and build this up and become this huge conglomerate. And he was like, 
why? I just want to lie here in my boat and right. I'm happy. Exactly. So how important is work in your life? The students can talk about, oh, work, free time. What's more important? Why do people work? Do you work to live? Do you live to work? How do you spend your free time? What would you do in your dream job? My Creighton students have great discussions with this. If somebody gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it? Um, so would you be like the tourist or would you be like the fisherman? And then as you read the story, you see what the setting is. It even gives more specific on where it takes place. Could you picture the scenery? I don't picture the scenery exactly like the little video did. Um, how are the tourist and the fishermen described? What's important? Contrast the way they speak. Why did Boo write the story? He actually wrote it on for like the German Labor Day. Um, in 1963 and then the story the guy walks away and the in the little clip he's mad and he walks away um, the story doesn't have it that way so what do you think the tourist does when he goes home did the fisherman change his mind or is like nah I'm still gonna go work and make my money are things different today than they were back in 1963 when Boo wrote the story. And then one of the possible assignments, writing assignments is you overhear this conversation between the tourist and the fisherman. Um, what are you write, gonna write on your postcard back to your friend? What do they, what do you think? What would you do? What would you write on that postcard? Okay. Questions so far? So why do we use pictures in a language class? It helps us to establish meaning. And it also gives us in something to talk about or to use the language about that then brings it within their reach of being able to then talk about something. Exactly. So it's easier to understand if you have something for a picture. You can show a video clip. It's a lot easier than reading a reading a text, if the story has pictures with it, it's easier. Sometimes just a picture by itself is open, like that one. We don't know exactly what's happening in that last picture that I showed. More interpretation, um, it's an active process. Gee, I have to think about what I, what's in this picture. And then it can help us understand the text as well. Ziggy Pivik was our um, central central region rep to actful and did a presentation and so this comes from from his um, presentation so if you're dealing with you can deal with pictures or you can deal with caricatures or political cartoons so what kind of statement do they make you can analyze okay what time is it what's the place uh why are they what's the drawing what's the intent of the drawing what's the effect um who wrote it, who, who drew it, and what style is it? Is there anything that stands out? There are different difficulty levels of analyzing a caricature. If you're at a level one, level two, you don't need to ask as many hard questions as you could as a, at a level three or level four. So here are two caricatures or political cartoons. So for those who don't speak German, um, reunification in 1989 and a year later, um, compare the two pictures. What do you see in the, what do you see in the first picture? What do they do? What's happening? They're happy to see each other. They broke through the wall. It's euphoric. They're celebrating, they're hugging. Right. And how about a year later? They put the wall up again. <laughs> yeah. They've had enough of each other. Yeah, this isn't as cool as we thought. What problems arose, et cetera, et cetera. They talked about your um, Mauer im Kopf, the wall in your head. It's like, oh, we didn't expect it to be like this. Everything's not 
roses coming up roses. This comes from an Internationalist publication from 1989. And I love this um, as a whole series of political drawings. So Versailles, sometimes you have a title, um, sometimes you don't. So what could students take away from this? So when was this? Um, who are these people? Um, who's signing and what are they signing? Um, what does that say? Uh, reparationen. So you'd have to ask what that is. What And gee, that weight's falling on a person. Why? Mm, situation in Germany after that. And then what's happening here? Oh, the guy's returning home with injuries and bye-bye. So the meaning, um, the little book had, I have the English version and the German version. So this came out of the English, the English meaning then. So Wilhelm Dutzweite left, went to the Netherlands after, after the war. Um, uh, the inflation was bad, people were hungry. Here's one more from that same book. Um, whose hand is it? You guys can answer here on this one. Mm -hmm. That's the US. Oh, how do you know that? Uh, the flag on the arm. Oh. And what's in the hand? Uh, it says care. So it has to be something that is giving to helping them caring for somebody or providing care for the people mm -hmm. that it's taken to. And what was this? Food or materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anybody ever heard of the Marshall Plan before? Oh, what I couldn't read that? it. Okay. Something? Yeah, the the, my yeah. screen thingy is in the way there. It says Marshall Plan on it. Yeah, it was the program that was set up by um, Congressman to go ahead and provide for the restructuring of Germany so it could survive. Mm -hmm. um, what are these ladies doing? Trümmerfrauen, cleaning up. Uh, so. In other words, just clearing, clearing the city of all the rubble that happened to be destroyed all around. So why is it only ladies doing the work? <laughs> I asked my question, this, my students this question too. <laughs> <laughs> um, the men are either dead they've been taken as prisoners of war, or they may be infirm, or maybe they're too scared to even show themselves um, right. because where they might be living. So it's mostly women that are going to have to do the work because the men basically have been decimated by the war. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have this little boy eating chocolate and- uh, He's quite hefty. Yeah, he looks pretty good, doesn't he? <laughs> he does um, <laughs> so what is he eating? Um, the chocolate is not chocolate, so oh, it's why not? written in English, and that would lead me to believe that it must be um, like the that the soldiers used to carry the hot Hershey chocolate bars and bring them in as um, kind of in their own rationing. They would have them, and so they gave them out. And I do know in association, like with the um, military coming in, that a lot of times they would hand them out to the children. Yeah, chocolate and gum. Um, it was my actual, my girlfriend's husband was a little kid at the end of World War II, and they, they had been, the little kids had been told, ooh, watch out for the Americans, those are bad people, and they would come and give the kids chocolate and gum and made them huh. realize that they weren't these really bad people that were going to do bad things to them, so, yeah. And then that's the explanation for that one. Um, I like pictures. Um, in my German literature class, we talk about the various um, literature periods. And so when we're talking about the romantic period, this is a Belgian painter, but I still like the painting a lot. Um, so 
first of all, why is it romantic period? So we would, we've talked about that. So you can talk about that. What do you see here? If you're teaching this in high school, I don't know whether you can show this completely. Or not, but <laughs> I'm a Creighton, so it works out okay. So what's the situation here? Um, oh my gosh. Uh, well, that there's a baby's foot hanging out of the cauldron. Uh, yeah. And she looks like she has a knife in her hand. Yeah. And that the knife actually does have blood on it. And her, her disheveledness with also her odd smile. It's really macabre. <laughs> In essence, and I can, I'm trying to figure out, is that a baby? It looks like a baby in her lap, but then mm -hmm. the cloth also looks like it's bloody as well. So I'm like, is that the leg from the baby? Yeah. Oh. So the title is Hunger, Wahnsinn und Verbrechen, if you can't see the top oh, of that. Oh, so yeah, well, that would make it, yeah, okay. <laughs> a craziness and crime, for those who don't speak German, don't speak German. So the students have the, the as an assignment then, crazy. how does the lady get yeah. into the situation? Is she crazy? What's happening here? So what will happen to her? What has happened? Why would you do? Why would she cut the leg off of her baby? So they mm -hmm. have to write a story talking about what is going on in this picture. So a possible writing assignment. This is one of my favorite books that we found. Um, and it's called Delisa. And you can do it very easily using comprehensible input. And it shows the life of a lady from birth to when she's in her 90s. So it starts from the Kaiser site and her death after reunification. So it's this whole German history all in this little children's book. So the good thing about it is, these are my questions. I have a PowerPoint. Um, the students have access to the book or the text, but they see this picture. So before you even have them read anything, they can look at the picture and just describe the picture. Um, and then, so what's the time of the first book? Where does the story take place? When was Lisa born? Uh, who are the people in the room? Then once you read the paragraph, how did they, what's her baptized name and how do they call her? Why? Um, she's baptized as Henrietta Elizabeth, but they call her Lisa. And so what do you, what do the people look like? Are they happy? So very, very accessible, I think, to to high school, like level three, I don't know, Kelly, maybe you know better than I, level three, four? Yeah, level three, they could do it with some support. And actually I have that book. So I was like, oh yeah, that would be a good idea. So I might be hitting you up. <laughs> but yeah, I think it, it would be very accessible, particularly when we're looking at Volta, Hata, and those sorts of things that that is the primary time when I do the Preteritum. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So and this is just another page out of that. So you see now she's older. So when is this? Gee, what are these black, red, and white flags? Um, what's Lisa's, if you have the, the book, what's the name of Lisa's street? Um, why are the people cheering? Um, why are they hugging here? And then you see that the First World War has started and they're happy. So they had to support their fatherland. And Lisa is saying goodbye to her dad. And what is she thinking? So it goes clear through World War II, the change in the names of the stores. You get a little bit of um, colonial waren. So you can talk about the uh, colonial goods, what col colonies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, clear through reunification and her living in an apartment when some foreigners come to live in her building and she's over 90. So it's really cool to go through. So I have PowerPoints with all the pictures and then questions. So yes, Kelly, you'll have access to this at the end. Um, and then I've put in extra 
um, resources at the end of, sorry about my dog, extra, extra, extra resources that they could click on if you wanted more info. And then there's some grammar exercises also. So just who are the people here? And then true or false activities. And then past tense. Um, so is it a Haben word or is it an ist word? And they have to do the activity. Okay, flipping gears again. So that was using literature to um, teach history. And now you can teach history with historical content. You can do grammar activities. So my example here is the um, 20th anniversary of the fall of the wall, which is now 30. So you know how old my PowerPoint is. But I took pictures from the historical content and then had them do a past tense activity with it. You could make it either narrative past or conversational past. So here are just a couple of examples from that PowerPoint slide presentation. So you see the verb end in. So they would have to tell me what would go in the blank there. So you would say end it to, or the rubble ladies worked hard. Arbeiteten. 1948 war die Blockade. Sprang. You can say, oh, that's a Trabi. Oh, where a Trabi? So you can do more conversation with it if you want, but you can do it, do it for the grammar if you want to practice the past tense verbs, which we have to do a lot. Okay, so that's just one example. Graphic novels. Kelly, do you do any graphic novels? Do you have your kids read any? And we just lost. Is she still there? <laughs> so graphic novels, why might you use graphic novels in, in a language class? They're relatively easy because of the pictures. Students like the graphic novels. Uh, they can be good for struggling readers. They have to make inferences about the panels and fill in the gaps between what happened in the various pictures. And then it can give you that bridge into more complex topics. This is a book that I just recently got. It's called Drüben over there. And it talks about um, East Germany, obviously. So when I first read it, I was like, ooh, that might be a little hard for um, lower levels. But you might be able to do it more comprehensible input um, style talking about what do, you, what do you see in the pictures here. Um, so three years after my dad and mom left East Germany, my dad wrote his parents a letter who were then they were still living in East Germany and you could talk about, oh, well, where do they live? Um, do you find the building pretty or ugly? Um, is it a new building? Is it an old building? Um, and we lived in the West. And then I was going to kindergarten. So you see, oh, so what is it? You could talk about that again. What is that? Oh, the wall. And which side is it on? And how do you know that? Um, so they were starting their new life, but they got a note back from the parents who don't want to care about any contact. Oh, so the dad doesn't have much contact with his parents. Why would that happen? And then it kind of gives you a flashback on their life before they left. And so that's the mom and the dad with the younger guy and his grandparents had been members of the Communist Party and that they had come from a Jewish background. And the little kid goes to kindergarten and somebody says, my grandma's picking me up. And the little kid's sad and he says, oh, what's wrong with you? Well, how come grandma never picks me up from kindergarten? So they have to draw a picture where everybody lives. We live here and Oma and Opa live here. 
and then it gives you another flashback what happened uh, the house was broken into and only a picture of the dad was stolen and then they decide oh, are we gonna go or are we gonna stay and she says i want to leave and he says no i want to stay here so she had come from a more liberal family and he was from this communist um, background so the little boy says we didn't learn we didn't get to know grandma and grandpa until after the fall of the wall so they go back and normally we talk when we're on a car trip but this time we didn't have any music and it was pretty quiet in the car and so then they so it goes back and they meet the grandparents then so you have to read the book but i think high school kids could do that one as well this one is not a graphic novel but it's gives you has some pictures in it and it gives you short readings so how was life like in um divided germany it's actually a kids book for german kids over the age of eight so is it accessible to our students and here's why i think it is because here's one of the pictures so what are the who are these men and what are they doing um when is it and what are they talking about? So you see the bird divided and here's the traditional OT and the French hat. And, um, and then you get the little paragraph talking about how Germany was divided into four zones after World War II. So how was life in the 70s and 80s? Um, and our students don't have any clue. Um, I was in high school at that time, so yeah. So, uh, your parent, how did what were your parents doing in the 70s and 80s? So, it was life like in West Germany and East Germany? The wall went up in 61, so 10 year, 10, 20 years into that. How was life like? What were the differences? Was everything in the East bad? And then it talks about work for everybody, didn't have unemployment, women worked to a great degree, and the kids were taken care of. They had places in the in the preschool and kindergarten and here's another picture um what do you see here oh this guy looks like he's watching somebody looking at somebody they all oh, he's got a newspaper here and this talks about the stasi so the secret police and that if i were talking about this i'd probably show a short segment from the lives of others um, I wouldn't show the whole film to a high school class, but you could do little parts of it. And then it goes clear through almost to the fall of the wall. So who are these people? What are they doing? When was it? Why? They've got candles. Oh, that almost looks like a hippie here. Um, so what's happening? And then you see that was the peaceful protests before in Leipzig. Nikolai Kirche, Montagsdemonstrationen. And if you wanted to go further, it leads into another book called Fritzi war dabei, and I loaned my book out and I never got it back. Um, but I really liked that when it talked about the peaceful revolution and how the family participated in the revolutions. And that book was, um, I actually bought Olaf when we were at the Nikolai Kirche in, um, Berlin and Leipzig the last time with the group. And there's also a little DVD that is called Fritzi that's related to the book that, again, could be used in, in the classroom easily. Uh, last time when we went with our Creighton group to Leipzig, Berlin, we went, did a day trip to Leipzig and we did the DDR Museum and I took some pictures. So this is one of my pictures. It's the Ten Commandments, basically, for socialist people. And what could you do with this? So you could talk about, um, again, grammar. You should do this. Oh, where do your verbs come in? What words can you figure out? Um, so I would look at it grammar-wise, for one thing. And then, um, conversation topic so 
when your parents were growing up or grandparents were growing up, did they have a refrigerator? Did they have a washing machine? Did they have a TV? Did they have a car? Oh, what kind of car did they have? So easy conversation there. Do you have a cell phone? Do you have a, do you have a TV in your dorm room or in your bedroom? Um, how was, how about in East German times? Was it, what do you think? And then you see this graphic. So per hundred households. So this was 1962, 1970, and then 1975. So 1970, I'm sure more than 70% of our, 56% of our families had refrigerators here and washing machines. So you can see, and then you can talk about how long it took them and that they had to be on a list and why they had to wait so long to get those things. And then you can talk about what kind of car they had if they got one, would it be like ours? And you could show a short clip from the movie Goodbye Lennon. Again, that one takes a lot of pre-teaching if you're gonna show it, um, maybe more than what you wanna do at a high school level and you have to watch out because there are a few clip, little things you have to edit out to show it to high school. And then another good historical topic for um, German teachers is die Weisse Rose. So these are, I would ask what these are. Oh, Weisse Rose. So who are these people? Um, what is this? Where do you think it is? Um, why is that on the ground? The first time that I went to Munich and wanted to see that, I walked completely by it and, and missed it because it's just right there on the sidewalk as you're walking into the university building and you don't pay attention that those are actually yeah, part of the monument. Uh, various things I have in the Google Drive that you'll have access to. There's an uh, article there. We used to have a little magazine called the Roller. And so there's an article about the Weisse Rose. Um, there is a book by, I don't know how to pronounce that, Saideb with a CD that's a high school level. It's an A2 level book. Um, there is a graphic na uh, book, and I don't have it, but um, this comes out of that, and it looked a little more difficult than this book. And then there is the original black and white movie, Die Weisse Rose, and then there was a remake, Sophie Scholle die Letzten Tage, that's a newer movie about the white rose. Another good book I, that I used when I was at East is Damas was Friedrich. Um, and the good thing about this book is you can take a chapter or two out and just do that. And you don't have to do the whole book because it's rather large. It would take a long time to do the whole thing. The neat thing about it is it's written in first person. So you really feel an emotional, more emotional connection. Um, students could make a podcast, they could make a short video of a scene, they could make a graphic novel version of a chapter, or they could take and they could be the news reporter and write a newspaper article about one of the events. Um, good, good chapters on all of that. Talks about the, talks about the um, Holocaust period. If you like Bavaria and König Ludwig. This is a new book that just came out in 2021. It's written like a krimi, a, like a little crime novel, could be used as free voluntary reading. I would say it's probably about an A2 level. Um, Eric Richards has put out a couple of them, but it shows, it talks about the, the death of König Ludwig kind of proving that he was actually killed because the little kid sees the sees it happen and here's the political cover-up taking place. So I, I actually enjoyed reading it. A fun, just a fun read. Switching gears again, music. Why would we use music in the classroom? I love love to use music. It can be motivational. You can decrease his anxiety. Um, music makes vocab easy to remember. The lyrics are repetitive. And then there's also some cultural content. This year we did March Music Madness that somebody on our the listserv puts out. And 
the 112 students kept, kept asking, and I do it before class starts because um, nobody was in my room this year, it was nice. So we do it before class starts and they could vote on it, but they would say, play that song again. And they had it memorized by the, by the end because they were listening to it on, the, uh, on their own, which was a kind of neat. So some songs that um, might be possible. This one I just found the other day. This is a new thing. I have not taught it and it's rather long, but it's a Stasi ballad that might fit in if you were talking about the Stasi and uh, watching any of the East German um, spy stuff. Um, Biermann was a dissident, a songwriter, a Liedermacher, which is a whole category of songs on its own, communist, nonconformist, um, stripped of his East German citizenship. And I didn't know that his daughter is Nina Hagen, who was the um, basically one of the first German punk rockers. So I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Um, songs to try out relating to history. Uh, Reinhard May is a, he's very easy to understand, sings normally with a guitar. He has one on Mein Berlin that talks about the history of Berlin. The Ärzte are more of a rock group, but Hora um, after the wall, wall fell. Kai Niemann comes from East Germany. And in 2001, he wrote Im Osten, which talks about uh, East German identity and that East German girls can kiss better and just kind of a fun, upbeat tong song. And then 20 years after the fall of the wall, he wrote Wir sind das Volk, which is what the East Germans, like the people in Leipzig that were protesting, were saying when they, when they walked through the streets and he's really being critical of politicians. So that would be a, a neat one. I haven't taught it, but that would be a neat one if you're talking politics and what do we think about our politicians. And then, um, how much time do I have? A little more time. M one of my favorite ones, this one's not exactly history, but it's great for past tense. And it talks about very recent past, so recent history. Um, so I'm gonna, and what I do, what I do with it, and then I'll play it. I have, I made a PowerPoint to go with the lyrics, and I, so I, cue up the YouTube video of Jasper singing this song, and I play my PowerPoint at the same time, and then we have to do it more than once, and we talk about some of the cultural things then, and. Then I show, then I made my own PowerPoint and then the students make a PowerPoint. So let me see if I can share this PowerPoint. So I'm not envious of all of this stuff, I'm not envious of your nice big vocabulary that you have the cell phone that you go to ha and m and you have 20,000 receipts. I'm not, I don't care about um, SpongeBob. I can do without Chucks and Cola Zero. When I, this is the good part. When I was your age, we watched videos. We didn't have DVDs. We put photos in a photo album and Pluto was not a planet yet, or but was unplanned, not a planet anymore. I don't envy you of your Hello Kitty, Tasha. And I ask them if anybody have any Hello Kitty stuff that's always popular in German, like gift shops and things and your anti-terror buttons. I don't, I'm not envious of your, all your fans and that you have rock band sessions in the, ugly basement and we can talk about McDrive. The Germans don't have a drive through. They call it McDrive when it's, uh, when it's in, when you're in Germany. And when I was your age, we didn't have Bill and, or Bill and Tom didn't have any fans. Bill and Tom, my high school, and this is like 15 years old now, they were the Tokyo Hotel, 
we listened to pop and not emo bands. Um, you had to have talent to play poker and we didn't have Euro and Scent. Eisberg Knut was this bear, little bear that was born in the Berlin Zoo and Harry Potter was just getting his teeth. And so that's the song. And then, going back to my PowerPoint. It's not gonna go the right place probably. Darn it. So I have a whole PowerPoint about this, but I put them on one little one little slide for you. And the fun part for the students is I say you have to watch out because I might be in some of these pictures. So when I was your age, we watched Mission Impossible. Uh, I played first violin in orchestra. Um, my girlfriends and sisters and I danced every year on Dance on the Green when I was in elementary school. We didn't have McDonald's, we had Golden Point. My dad drove a 57, yes, that color, uh, Chevy and gas cost 36 cents. So I looked up, okay, what does gas cost? Okay, how old was, how old was I in night? And um, when I was 18, what year was it? So I looked up, gas was 36 cents a gallon. Yeah, we can be envious of that. The Berlin Wall still stood, so you can put some German pictures in there. Um, I had long hair and wore glasses and my best friend was Anne. And Huskers won all of their football games because they were champions in 1971. So I graduated in 1971. So that's what, what I do with that. Um, and we practice past tense. And then I have another slide, another PowerPoint that I take some of those pictures of those again and take the verbs out and they practice past tense verbs with those. And then it's their turn and they have to make a PowerPoint talking as if they were talking to an elementary student when I was your age. So they're now 17, 18. Okay, what was it like when you were five? And so they have to do research. Oh, gee, what did I do when I was five? So here are some of their answers. We only had three Mountain Dews. I didn't have a handy, I didn't have a cell phone. We had video cassettes. The Twin Towers fell. Um, somebody said that it, they've had the first touch cell phone um, who was on TV at the time, shows that they watched. So they, I, they really enjoyed doing that, making that activity and putting themselves, I was in ROTC. Um, so they put some of those little things into, into their PowerPoints to personalize it. This comes from Ziggy Pivik again from Milwaukee. And he has a list of vocabulary that goes with Berlin, reunification wall however you want and then has examples and i have the it's in the google drive the different poems the elfchen where you have 11 words in a form or a stair step poem or a haiku and the the models are there and you use so many words per line and make it's very specific but they can make their own poetry that way so that would be a good writing activity after you've done a lot of vocabulary on whatever topic. It wouldn't even have to be historical. Okay, then um, other ideas that I have in the Google Drive. I like to do architecture. So you could talk about forms. It's round, it's square, it's pointed. Um, I talk about the different architecture styles. So romanic and gothic and renaissance and show different styles and then as a writing activity they could write about which 
style of architecture or which building they liked and found best and what nicest and why. And they could even personalize it more and say, okay, describe a building in Omaha or in Chicago or where it could be on vacation. It doesn't have to be one in Omaha that you like and use the vocabulary they've taught. Um, sometimes I will combine my architecture with or art history a little bit with the music and show, okay, here, here's that picture like I showed earlier, and here would be music that we were written at the same time and go back earlier on Gothic and what kind of music was written at the same time and played and um, show them that. And then one of my favorite activities also is Schwarzfahrer. It's a little bit historical, um, but it's also dealing with um, prejudice. And so it, I get uncomfortable watching it because I don't like to hear Germans talk negatively about other people or anybody talking about negatively about minorities and the lady in the video does but it's a really good one for discussion of prejudice and what would you do and social, social justice issues if you want to do that. Um, and then in, I could, I think I've got my Google Drive. Let's see if I can show what I've got on. That's it. No. Uh, let's see if I can. Oh, can I go to my Google Drive? There we go. So on, this is my Google Drive that I will get that you'll have access to. I have the things listed here are the things that I presented in the PowerPoint. So the Jasper PowerPoint, my um, a history, music history. Here's the present, the PowerPoint presentation from today. The my perfect pa my past tense activity. Um, my art history PowerPoint. So the things that I created are there. And then the story resources, there are several activities there. The Stasi poem from Biermann, the Lisa text, um, a different, another story. And then secondary resources. Here is a whole folder on um, the Schwarzfahrer. It's a short film that won a big prize in the, I don't, in the 80s, I think. Um, some of my white rose activities, um, the PVIC uh, PowerPoints talking about using pictures and poetry in, um, in the classroom. And then here are two PDFs of 60 years of the, the wall. Um, that you have access to. And I got the point again. So all of those things are listed there. And there's the link. We can put that into the chat. Um, or I will share that with Crystal one or the other since it's just Olaf. So there's access to my drive and I'm done. Questions? Thank you so much. This is very helpful actually. You know, I 
do not know German, that I really like your ideas. Even you have ideas for even lower level class. And I used to think maybe I cannot talk about, I mean, something like history, something like poetry, maybe so complicated, but you show me some ideas about how to use it. This is really awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I do have uh, a few questions. I see for a, a lot of pictures you have and also the uh, stories you recommended, you always have some very good questions. <laughs> and do you have some suggestions? I mean, because we our webinar is going to be posted online and many teachers, I think they don't have time to attend right now, but they will come to it later. Do you have suggestions uh, to ask good questions? I think the comprehensible input, um, the whole that whole movement has helped a lot. How can I simplify what I what I'm doing? It doesn't have to be this huge complex thing, especially at the lower level, that they don't have the vocabulary to answer. But Ali Moeller, Dr. Ali Moeller, our mentor and friend and person that we all love, has talked about scaffolding. So you just have to start small and build up from that. And once they have that vocabulary, then they can do more difficult questions. And if you pre are doing any of the pre-teaching of the vocabulary, that will obviously help as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I remember Dr. Muller's methods class. <laughs> yeah, she's my advisor. Yeah, I really think you have, I mean, uh, listed the question out and how you can guide them through the processing and uh, communication among the students. That's really good. And how do you find such great stories? You have so many resources, so much resources. <laughs> I love doing that kind of stuff. So if I, if we need something, if we have an idea of, oh, we could teach that. It's a, internet is so amazing that you can find just about anything there if you look hard enough. So I'm, I, I just like to explore around and get lost in the internet, finding finding cool stuff that you can use. So, yeah. Do you have criteria or some kind of rubric when you are choosing materials for different levels of students? First of all, I want it to, hopefully to be something that the students are going to enjoy. Um, and I find that the older I get, my music tastes are different than theirs, so I don't always hit it the first time through. Um, but they're pretty forgiving on that. It's like, okay, we'll do a different song later, but you have to listen to the song. So I, and um, we did German convention for a long time. And one of the competitions was always a music video. So you have to take a German song and make a music video of it, kind of to go along with the, with the text. So every time I listen to German music, I'm thinking, could they make a video out of that? And if they could make a video out of that, I can probably teach it. So I'm always listening for texts that that are thoughtful enough or fun enough that um, that we could work with it. And vocab vocabulary that they're going to use is not. It can't be some abstract, obscure thing that they're not going to use as well. Um, what else? No, I forgot what. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your question. What was your question? Did that answer your question? Uh, is there uh, uh, some criteria rubric help you uh, identify to choose materials that for different levels of students? Yeah, you mentioned about student interest student and also interest, um, what they can do with the material. Yeah, that's right. Really it has nice. to be the right level, and and finding that right level is is sometimes hard because I think okay, yeah, I, sometimes I forget what. Okay, I've been doing German enough that, uh, that yeah. whoa, it's uh, that was too hard for them. So sometimes you miss miss on the level, and you go, uh oh, that was too hard, um, or what, or how can I rephrase it or whatever. But the pictures, the that the especially that Lisa book with those pictures and the text. I mean, you can talk about the, that without um, actually reading the paragraph first, but but talk about what do you see in the picture, even if you're not reading the whole text, they're getting that idea of what happened throughout history, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, sometimes it's like uh, when we we are language teachers, we so enjoy language, and sometimes we forgot where our students are. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, I like your way, the way you like or you enjoy finding materials. You're always thinking about your students. It's more like a mindset. You always have this on your mind as like, I can always thinking about your students. That's, yeah, I have to say great teachers do that. <laughs> yeah, you're a great teacher. Thank you. And I, do you have textbooks or you all, you you try to find things that to put into your curriculum that uh, I mean stories and uh, uh, po poetry and other things articles that can fit into your curriculum or do you follow a textbook. When I was at Bellevue East, we did have a textbook um, for level one, two and three, but four or five, I could pretty much do whatever I wanted which was nice. I could I could add other stuff in, in those lower levels, but it was um, pretty much textbook based. But I did several years at UNO and I'm now at Creighton and we have a book for the first two semesters, but it's very easy to adapt that and to um, supplement to, and because it doesn't have a lot, it has a lot of holes in it on how I would put it in the right order. And when I was at UNO, Dr. Cliver, who's a good colleague said, it would be fun to, to do it without a textbook because textbooks are really hard to find and, and at the college level, they're really expensive. And so it's like, how can we save the students money? And so she and I sat down and she gave me a list of topics and some vocab and I put it all together and did a variety of sources and things so we could do what we wanted and find the resources that we wanted so i've so i and at creighton we kind of do that as well um so it's and again i like doing that kind of stuff it takes a lot of time but um i like that stuff so yeah it's very enjoyable when i was listening i just i'm taking notes you can see <laughs> and i really like your idea and it's very inspiring and I want to do so the similar, you know, I'm thinking about, yay, this is a good idea. I want to do, I want to find a Chinese story. I want to uh, find some music and I want to do the same, but I don't teach now, <laughs> but I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you so much. And so uh, can I share your, um, the Google Drive, the folder with other, uh, teachers i mean sure. can i put on website yes okay thank you so much this is very helpful and i feel so sorry i didn't find the i mean really good time that all the teachers can come okay. <laughs> sorry about that that's okay we've got it recorded so if they want to watch they can yeah thank you and yeah. i'm going to stop uh recording right now